powerful tool. And I think I'm going to go ahead and start a recording for people that don't make it. I know there are a few people that um, somebody started the recording, so thank you for that. I know that there are a couple of people that are at a conference um, and a few more that are on holiday that specifically asked to go through this uh, this particular thing, so they, they can't be here. But uh, the first thing I wanted to say, for those of you who just joined, is that um, the this thing that I'm going to talk to you about today, I view it as one of those very important things that academics in um, crop research, in agriculture research, even as broad as all of agriculture, I think it's something that you should be aware of. <clears throat> and the thing I'm referring to is called the, the DSAT cropping system model. And uh, what does that mean? What is the DSAT cropping system model and why do I impart so much importance to it? Well, um, I impart importance to it. I'm going to get my um, stylus here in case I want to make some notes, some cheeky notes. I impart so much importance to it because, um, partly because uh, I've just captured this screenshot from um, Google Scholar. And uh, one of the ways that we impart importance in academics is um, is by how many other scientists uh, view something as important. And this is one of those papers that a lot of people in agriculture view as very important. We can measure this in all sorts of ways. We can measure it by the uh, journal it was published in, or we can measure it by the number of citations that it's had. Um, or by the number of um, a number of citations by papers that have cited it. And by all of those measures, this is a really excellent paper, but especially the number cited. I don't know how you other um, young and uh, young colleagues and regular colleagues uh, view view the number of citations a paper has, but uh, it Here's here's my way of judging this stuff. If you have um, if you've written a paper and it's been out there for for five years or so, at a minimum, it takes a while for people to become aware of a paper in agriculture. And this paper, as you can see, is is 20 years old, and um, it has 4,162 citations. Well, if a paper has been out for around five years. Usually it takes a few years for pe other people to become aware of a paper and then to start citing it if they view it as important. I view that if a paper doesn't have 25 citations after five years, it's unimportant. Nobody has read it. If it has 50 citations, um, and, and here I'm talking about citations, let's say in excess of uh, authors of the paper them citing themselves and in papers that have happened in the last five years. If it has 50 cit citations after five years, I think that's a pretty solid, solid showing. I mean, I, I would aspire for my own papers to have 50 citations. 100 is kind of a magic amount. The majority of, of papers, the vast majority of all scientific papers do not have 100 citations in the world. <laughs> They have less than that after five or more years. And if you get a thousand, I, I would call a paper that has a thousand citations. There's some caveats to this claim, like um, some fields like human medical biology tend to get a lot more citations than other fields. But pretty much this applies to any field. If it has a thousand citations after five or more years, it's a classic. It's a very important paper. And if you have 4,000, especially in a field like agriculture research, it's something that you have to be aware of. It's a very, very important paper that a lot of other people really rate. This is one of those papers, and it's why I say it as such. And it's a little bit unique. So what the, the DSAT cropping system does is it aims to um, predict yield 
in agriculture settings, mostly for arable crops, but also for root crops and, uh, and other kinds of crops, a few fruit crops as well. Um, and it, it does so from a very um, fundamental viewpoint. So it takes into account within the cropping system, and we'll just barely um, look at this a little bit today. It takes into account um, soil. It takes into account um, the crop itself. It takes into account the uh, inputs that farmer might do to the field. And these include like um, uh, water and uh, nutrients. Um, Paul, I'm just thinking of you and I wonder if there's a beat module um, in, in DSAT. There might be, if you remind me at the end, we can look into the files and see if there is one in case you're interested in this. But um, I, I hope Jim is interested, Jim Monahan is interested in this too. Because some of us are really excited about it, and I never knew about this. But what the system does is it takes all of these um, inputs and it makes a, a prediction. Uh, I haven't even told you all of the things it takes as inputs. So there's one other really important one that I, I forgot to mention. Uh, what color shall I make it? I'll make it my favorite color of goldenrod. And that's that it takes in weather. And, um, and, and of course, the um, it takes in um, spatial variation in all of these things as well. And uh, it predicts, it predicts uh, yield. So uh, the yield it predicts in several different ways. It predicts um, all sorts of things. If it's a tuber crop, it, it predicts tuber weight and above ground growth and root weight. If it's a seed crop or a um, cereal crop, it it's the weight of the, the crop. And again, the, um, the how fast things are growing. And it does this based on um, primary biology. And uh, you can design experiments. Uh, you, can, you can make forward predictions into the future. As a matter of fact, I would say that the DSAT system is a one-stop shop to, uh, to, to do virtual experiments for something like a, a digital twin farm. And it's a sandbox that you can use. And it comes with, built into the system, the software framework, it comes with um, uh, a, hundreds of historical classic experiments that parameterize the predictions. And of course, it wouldn't be as powerful as I think it is if you couldn't build your own experiments into the system. So you can use it for current experiments as well as historical experiments. And uh, I, if you haven't, if you can't tell from the way I've described it so far, um, I will uh, I will put it in uh, maybe red font that I think it's amazing. I think this is an amazing tool. And uh, if if earlier in my career, you know, I started off my career um, in statistics and ecology and applied ecology and conservation. If I had studied agriculture ecology early in my career and I didn't know about this, this system, uh, I, I would be missing something big. It's a powerful tool. Now, as great as it is, why doesn't everybody know about it and use it? Maybe, in fact, could you just indicate in the chat if you have heard of DSAT and you're aware of it and what it does, or if you haven't, just a Y or an N in the chat would be um, interesting for us to take a little survey. Um, <clears throat> there's a catch is the reason you may not have heard of it. There's a small catch uh, and the catch is a very important one. And the, the catch is something we'll explore today. And the, um, the catch is that it's uh, very hard to use. It's very challenging and difficult to use. And I, I mean, um, I don't mean this like I talk to the students in my talk classrooms. I mean this with all the strength that I have as a as a as a career computer programmer, modeler, statistician, and biologist. I think it is very, very hard 
the system that they've built. And it's not because um, necessarily, I think there are a lot of reasons for that. I think it's it's hard in one sense because it uh, incorporates so much detail if you wish to include it in your modeling. But there is another reason, and it's really what I want to talk to you about today and what I want to show you today. There is another reason that it's hard, and that's that I'm just going to um, to uh, insert a another um, slide here. And uh, there's another reason that it's it's hard to use, and that's that um, I believe that this came about uh, in the 1980s uh, when when some researchers in the states and in other places started doing some serious crop modeling. And in the 1980s, um, they told me recently at a workshop I went to about this, the creators of the original um, software in the 1980s. So the, the uh, Garrett Hugenboom is uh, one of the guys on the, the big paper I just showed you. Um, he's the second author. And then um, uh, Professor Booty it was also at the workshop and, and he's the original, um, Ken Booty is the original um, programmer for this modeler uh, at the University of uh, Florida. Um, so he started programming this in a language called Pascal. And uh, then some other people started working with him and they added some some modules in Fortran, another computer programming language that is uh, very fast. And uh, then um, they wanted to do some other stuff that their current system wasn't doing. So they, you know, maybe this is the 1990s now. And uh, they hired some smart young programmers to do some uh, stuff in the C programming language. And then they wanted to expand the capability of um, of uh, what they had, and uh, they developed it into the 2000s. And in the 2000s, they made it into a Windows program, and uh, for that they use C++. And uh, what happened as they were developing it, because they're not commercial developers, in fact, uh, all of the system that I'm about to tell you about is 100% open source should you wish to go back to the original different programming languages and attempt to compile it yourself i think that would be quite hard to do and i'm not sure why you would want to do it anyway but um they uh they uh rather than rebuilding the whole system which is comprised of uh, about 20 individual computing executable modules Instead, they it mutated over time, and um, they they bolted it all together. And it's still under development. It's been under continuous development for around 40 years. It's amazing, but it's very hard to use. And um, a big innovation was the uh, Windows interface, and it looks something like this. And they have um, they have actually a collection of interfaces. Uh, they have um, the crop management data interface, the graphics interface, soil data interface, and so forth, and uh, other tabs down here with other interfaces that all just about work together. And you can see they have a number of crops. In fact, it's just going to bother me if I don't um, if I don't uh, go ahead and answer my own question I posed to. Um, <clears throat> to uh, you, Paul, whether or not DSAT has got, um, well, let's see what root crops that they that they do have. And I'll just drag this over here and we can just look together because I, I do want to show you the structure of how this lives on your computer as well. So uh, I've installed it on my root drive. You can see that I've installed it on my C drive in DSAT um, 48 and it's it's at version 4.8 now it's the newest version it's only been out for about six months and if we look down um, we have a folder for every crop and let's just pick alfalfa first before we 
see that and there are different kinds of um, ones and we'll look in some of these files in in just a minute i just wanted to see if um, there is beet and i see that there isn't beet but there are some other root crops um, like uh, there is potato um, somewhere in here i don't see it in my list oh there it is um, so if we were going to do some beet we'd have to create our own sets of files so we'll look at some of those in a moment now um, legendarily the people who use DSAT, they, they are, there's kind of a fellowship I've learned. In fact, if you go to meetings, academic meetings, if you go to one, you tend to meet people. And if you go year after year, you tend to get to know the people that go there. But I have never been to a conference like the one that I went to with Matt and George to, um, to this DSAT workshop, uh, where there was such a, a tight knit community uh, where people everyone knew each other and it was the most it was a unique conference compared to other ones I've ever been to and built right into the conference was training for how to use the latest version of this DSAT and I, I did go into to the United States with um, George and Matt a couple of weeks ago about six or eight weeks ago now and we took this this training and we're at this workshop for a week a whole week and I feel after a whole week of thinking really hard, and we were working, um, I've also never been to a workshop where we were actually doing activities starting at eight in the morning and finishing at six, working every single day for six days. I've never been to a conference where we worked that hard. And at the end of the six days, trying really hard with all the advantages that I personally have to uh, come on top of technically challenging stuff, I felt I had barely scratched the surface after 10 days. So um, one of the reasons that it's hard is that there are so many menus and that the, um, the format of the inputs to parameterize an experiment for a simulation are so complicated. And to give you an idea of what I mean, I, I just want to peek into one. So I'm coming back to uh, where is my little folder that I had just opened up. Let's come back over here and let's just um, <clears throat> first look into a um, let's look into a soybean one. So I know there are quite a lot of soybean experiments. Um, um, Ken Booty is a is a soybean expert, and so he, while he was developing this, he was incorporating in his own research. And um, one kind of file they have is called the X file for an experiment file. And uh, this SBX is a soybean experiment file. And if we just open that up, let's just open it up with um, a notepad. <clears throat> give you a feel for uh, what this is in. And what, what this is, is this is a uh, just a plain text file that has different data fields. And it's written in the uh, standardized data in input format that is very, very old fashioned. So we talk about tidy data in here and relational databases more rarely, but this predates relational databases, um, the widespread use of them anyway. And it also predates um, most computer programs and it also predates um, Microsoft Excel, this format. So this is an early computing data format where um, in Fortran fields were delineated by, uh, in this scheme, this at sign, and um, headers were delineated by this asterisk. So we have a header, a section for cultivars, and then we have an at sign um, showing the start of the data, and we have a, a couple of cultivars here. And what we see in this, this isn't a hugely long file, but it defines um, the conditions and the parameters for a particular experiment. And, and part of the difficulty is learning the format for the data. All right, so uh, what do I want to talk to you about today? I mean, if you really wanted to use this uh, and you're starting your career, you're in the middle of your PhD or, or you're interested in this kind of stuff and you want to run projects with it, um, there's no time like the present, but it will take some serious, 
serious study to get on top of. Now, I want to show you one other thing before we go on. Is um, I want to show you the DSAT. Home page. I'm just going to drop the um, the um, link in there. Now I mentioned that this is a free program, and it is uh, it's also open source. Now um, they don't have a link to their GitHub page, but they do they do have a GitHub re repo that's got the latest source code up, or at least um, it's got a recent version of it. I think 4.7 is up on their GitHub repo. We're not going to look at their GitHub repo today, but um, to download it and get this yourself, you can just go to the download menu and um, you can pick which one you want. The latest one is 4.8 and you have to request it, which is kind of annoying. I find it. I find this I probably if I were involved in developing DSAT, I would argue strongly that this prevents more people from using it and prevents it from being developed faster. Yet, if you email this within 24 or 48 hours, or maybe a couple of days this time of year, um, you will get answered back and you will get access to download it. I've been trying to think of a way that I could make my um, make a repository to make it more available for people I want to work with, and I probably will do that. In some form. So if any of you are interested in it, just you know, well, tell me in chat right now, and I'll I'll try to do it faster. That'll give me some incentive to do it faster. It's about one gigabyte to download everything, um, <clears throat> to uh, to install it. So anyway, you'd have to request that. And uh, also, I think somewhere on here is the um, the annual training. I think our picture is is up here possibly. Nope, we don't have ours. Maybe this is it. Somewhere up here, they they did have our um, our picture. Yeah, this is us and George and me and Matt are over on this end from this year. So that's all I wanted to show for that. But I wanted to show you one other paper today. It's not nearly as important as um, as the DSAT paper, but I, I flashed it um, briefly, and it's it's this paper. Uh, this is Hugenboom's paper. This is not the uh, one I wanted to show you. That's the important one that I think that you should be aware of. Um, instead, I wanted to show you this paper. So while we were at the conference, um, we were learning to go through the menus on the um, on the DSAT system, and I was already thinking at that time that everything is menu driven. And you have to edit these these terrible looking files that um, that look like this. Th this is one we'll work with in a little while, um, just to look at it. But this is an output from the model, and I'll, I'll walk you through what it means. But while I was uh, editing these, and, and in some of the some of the official training for the biologists that use this. They advocate manually editing files like this. And by manual, I mean adding and subtracting lines from these files by opening the text and typing it. And I was thinking to myself, this is absolutely crazy. What I would do is write a filter in R or Python to manipulate the text. And um, while I was, I, I literally wrote a filter um, to to do some things for our potato models. I'm not going to show you that today. I didn't want to um, take that away from George uh, and Matt who are who are working on that. So maybe we'll hear from them and their progress on that um, <clears throat> at a future meeting. But instead, I came across this paper, and it says it's a comprehensive R interface for the DSAC cropping model system. And I thought this is fantastic. And George and I downloaded it right there in the meeting. We started to use it, um, but we found that it didn't work exactly like it did on, uh, like it said on the tin. Uh, it uh, it was itself hard to use, and some parts of it were broken. Now this is a fairly recent paper, 
this only came out in 2020 and I thought, how can it already be broken? And the reason I discovered for this, and this is the last thing I'll say before we go through a little bit of code, is um, this is the DSAT repository for this, um, this researcher, Alderman, who um, wrote this R package. And this is the repository both for this manuscript that I just showed you and for the, um, the DSAT, <coughs> the DSAT uh, library that I'm going to talk you through in, in R. Now, what it, what is this thing supposed to do? Well, what it is supposed to do is it is supposed to use the R environment to give you scope to, um, to instead of manually editing or instead of using that Windows graphical user interface, to navigate all those different kinds of um, compiled modules. It gives you one clean R interface for people that already use R um, to be able to manipulate, build your own experiments and, and graph and do everything that one does in a system like R. By the way, um, well, I want, I want to explore the one in R and I'll do that with you today, but there is one in Python. Okay. The, now, the one in Python hasn't been developed for three or four or five years. That's the most recent um, development. And I just wanted to show you on this guy's repo that the most recent updates were um, the most recent one that I see on here at a glance for six months ago. And in the last six months, a new version of DSAT has come out. And um, that is why it didn't work for us in um, in Georgia when we were sit, sat there learning is because it had already changed enough that it had broken. <laughs> it's it's that complicated. And um, I also think that this um, well-meaning young research, Philip Alderman, um, is probably not a professional programmer and, and did his best to make something that worked for him at the time that he made it. And then he, he probably has run out of steam. Uh, I, I plan to reach out to him and um, and tell him that I'm interested in using it and fixing it for the latest version of DSAT. But in the meantime, um, if you if you read his paper, and I will upload this onto the R Herrick webpage, um, so you can just cut to the chase and download the papers, both the DSAT paper and this one, and uh, access the script I'm going to go through. In the meantime. Um, I'm going to go through my own edited version of his code in this paper, um, and and it mostly works after I've fiddled around with it. So um, uh, I'll show you uh, what I was able to do in a short time. Now I didn't give myself very much time to uh, to do this. Uh, instead, I'm just going to um, get rid of this, get rid of this, and we'll see how long uh, it takes me to do this stuff. Right, so here's the script, my script that goes through DSAT with um, with the DSAT R package. And uh, there's a fiddly part. Uh, I decided, well, I, did, I ran out of time to um, give you guys enough time to prepare to code with me. I, I realize people often don't code with me anyway, but there is a bit of prep that's required, namely that you have to acquire the compiled modules from the DSAT system and install it explicitly on your local computer to do this. In other words, what I'm trying to tell you is that the, the DSAT R package does not replace those compiled modules for the DSAT standalone program. Instead, it is just an interface that allows you to access those compiled modules from within R. So that's an important concept to to get over, and because of that, you you must acquire the uh, DSAT installation yourself, install it. Now, I can provide that with you, but you might want to go ahead and down uh, register for it anyway if you plan on really learning it, or even really um, exploring it in earnest. Because there is a there is a, a user's key that you'll be sent by email that allows you to to unlock and, and use the program. As far as I can tell, 
the uh, only reason for this gate that the users put up that it's Garrett Hugenboom that has designed this this user's key is so they can keep track of who's using it and what they're using it for. Um, it is available for commercial use and it's a it's a nonprofit academic organization that runs it, but they retain that little bit of a of a gate. I'm not sure why they do that, but um, it's probably worth doing that if you are interested in this. So. Um, so what I've done is um, I've set my working directory to that place on my computer where DSAT lives. I had to figure this out a little bit because um, <clears throat> the, um, the the functions in the DSAT package um, they didn't they didn't work very well. And I need to add DSAT. Um, to this, but uh, you also want to uh, go ahead and load up the tidyverse. And uh, if you guys don't know about Lubridate, the the package Lubridate, and I'm just going to make this a little bit bigger so you guys can, um, oops, so you guys can see it. Oops. If you don't know about the Lubridate package, it's a it's a tidyverse flavored package that allows us to use um, and manipulate date uh, data types. And uh, it is fantastic. I mean, if you ever work with dates once and have to figure it out, um, this basically figures it out all, all out for you, but you do have to learn how to use Lubridate, but it is wonderful. So we have to load those up for this. I'm gonna go ahead and set my working directory to um, where I've got DSAT installed. I've made a comment in here to just remind you that um, you do have to um, have to uh, install the full DSAT package and you will have to download it. And I've also given a little tag to the uh, Philip Alderman's GitHub page. And um, I don't think that the DSAT library is an official CRAN package. Just going back up to my table of contents here because I'll I'll go through that before we start, but uh, just with you, I want to um, kind of see DSAT CRAN. So it is an official CRAN package, and let's see when it was last updated. So it was published um, um, in January most recently, so it is up to date according to CRAN standards. I'm pretty impressed with that, and I wasn't aware of that. So I, I did download it from um, from um, uh, GitHub, and let's just have a look at the manual while we're here, see what they've got in it. Yeah, OK, so it's just you can see they've got functions to read stuff and to write stuff, and then one to run DSAT, the main DSAT module for running a, a, uh, a simulation right from the command line or right from the script. OK, so what we're going to do is I'm going to show you my setup. I'm going to, um, I've just in fact gone through the installation of DSAT. Then we're going to look at um, a soil data and read it in. We're going to look at weather data and we're going to look at the X file, the file X for experiments. We already did peek inside the soybean experiment file. Um, a batch file is one that runs an experiment. Let's say you've done some treatments in an experiment that you want to simulate. The batch file allows you to run that all at once. And then output, and I can already tell you that um, all of these were successful except uh, running the batch file from R. I still haven't been able to get this DSAT package to do that. Okay, so um, we have just about enough time to um, go through some of the code, and I'll show you the. It's very tidyverse oriented, so if you're not a tidyverse user. Um, I'll walk you through that stuff too. I am not a particular tidyverse user, as most of you know. I prefer um, base R. But uh, the first thing we're going to do is look at the um, first um, section that I have, and which we have already glanced at briefly, where we have uh, installed the packages and we load up the DSAT library. Um, now they have an option here to uh, in your system level options. When you install and load up the DSAT, the uh, DSAT.CSM um, is a 
is a parameter in your option in your R options file that tells the system where the executable lives on your system. So I've just done that for Windows computers and it seems to work, but I couldn't call it as you'll see later on. And then we're now we're in section two. We're going to modify the sat file uh, soil file. Now, um, before we look at this, I'm just going to go to this location in my on my hard drive that is created automatically when you install DSAT and let's just look in a soil file. So in the base directory, I find this very untidy, but I can just about stand it enough to um, walk you through the way that it is. Um, it's almost like I want to I want to. Um, with other people that are slightly anal retentive about um, data and folder organization, uh, as I think I, I am, I know people have accused me of, of that, and I do think it's true. Uh, I almost want to say that the way that this structure of the files is in this program is, is almost on purpose committing every um, organizational error that one could possibly create. So the soil directory is just inside the root directory, and it's filled with um, 38 soil profiles. Let's look inside one of them. So uh, inside this, um, as you know, soil profiles, um, we describe the soil and we want to um, simulate something that has a geospatial component. We're talking about one spot on the planet Earth. And uh, something we can measure about the soil in one spot on the Earth, it may well apply to some other points that are near it, around it, but the further away we get from that, the uh, less likely that's going to be true. And uh, the way these soil profiles, if you wanted to do something serious, like um, let's say that you wanted to um, simulate the crop rotation for um, the next five years or the next three years on the Harper Adams estate. Well, we would want to create a soil file that was structured just like this. We'd want to have a header like we see up here with uh, our own location. And then for every, maybe every field or every um, place that we think is similar enough to be treated independently in our simulations, probably every field um, would be a good way to do. Uh, we would have a different entry and each entry for each field looks something like this. And you can see there's a lot of stuff. Well, um, we have some information about what the um, variety that is being um, grown in the soil is and um, who has collected the data. Uh, a little bit about the um, where the country is. So this, the country field is Spain. The latitude is 41. The longitude is zero. So pretty far south of us. I would hate to have been there the last couple of days. Um, so this field is a little bit about the geo referenced location, including some just some text strings. This field. Um, now, now we're hitting a uh, a um, a field here that I would have to go to the index for the manuals for DSAT to figure out what these abbreviations. What is SCOM? It may be some sort of uh, soil category, but I would have to look it up to myself to be able to to um, interpret these. And then we have another field, um, and I know a little bit about what's in this field. So this SLB is the um, the depth of different bands of soil. So here they have um, measurements taken in a soil core at 30, 60, 90, and 120 centimeters. Um, and they have each of these columns are different measurements to do with um, soil moisture retention characteristics, um, soil particles particulate size characteristics uh, and and other parameters. And uh, minus 99 is the DSAT code for missing data. OK, so in this particular site, we have um, 
for this one site, we have several profiles that characterize different soil types. So there are three different soil profiles for this particular site. So if we go back to our folder, we have quite a lot of them. There are 38 of them, and there's a generic soil.sol file that um, has a, a really large number of profiles in it um, that, you know, we never in a million years would create one of these from scratch. Instead, we would probably go out, take a couple of soil cores or maybe even just one soil core from here in Harper and uh, try to find one of these soil profiles that, that matches. So let's just, you know, kind of look at a, another one. This is one in the default soil file. Remember, these are profiles given to us standing on the shoulder of years of ag research and they're meant for us to adapt them to our new site so we want to model this one's an example of deep silty clay um it's uh it's in it's a generic profile for some country like ours uh, and it's in the generic family and you know you can see these profiles so we might want to first find our soil type medium sandy loam deep silty clay you know, there are about 100 of them in here. All right, so um, this is an example of just uh, reading in profiles. We uh, have to read in the soil components. That's one of the essential things. By the way, if you don't know your soil profile, it doesn't stop you from learning or playing with this system. Uh, if you just have a general idea, we could just pick one and run with it until we know better, until we test how accurate our predictions are from, say, a measured historical yield. So this takes a little while to parse and read. I think it probably takes a little while. I should have set up my TikTok to see how long this reads in. I think it took about a full minute. I'm just gonna run through these pretty quick so we don't run out of time completely here. I do wanna just get to the last output file to show you. I have a few things as, as you see, a few sections to go through. It won't take very long to go through some of these. The soil one probably should have read in a shorter soil one because there are a are hundred plus soil profiles. When I wrote my own filter, um, started writing it in in the workshop and I, I finished it recently when we were manipulating some outputs. The reason it takes a while to read this stuff is that it's, it's using the scan function in R to uh, read every line, line by line, and then to remove the white space for data columns, assuming every bit of white space is a um, is a, um, a delimiter for data fields, and that's exactly what they're doing. And it's also identifying the different data fields based on the asterisk and um, and uh, other ones. So it finished. It says I got some warnings. Let's just peek in the warnings, and I bet it will be that there's um, some some uh, end of line errors, as I've been seeing that a lot. Let's just um, see, there is no warning message, but yet we get a warning. So I, what I see for a lot of these is when it reads a plain text file using that scan, um, it hasn't been corrected or it's mutated since the new version of DSAC came out. So when it gets to the end of line, it expects an explicit character, but they're not present in the, the Fortran data format that we're reading. So um, within that, um, if we, if I just bring out my um, window here so you can see this bit, uh, we can also choose in our soil file, um, if we go down past this, this header section to where the first data starts, as I mentioned, each one of these is a, is a particular kind of soil. This one's deep silty clay, generic. This is the name of the soil profile, and we can actually access these generic profiles um, singly with a function in the read soil package. So if I want to, if I want to access this first one, IB, you know, um, a bunch of zeros, one. And by the way, I haven't mentioned this, but um, these names are not arbitrary. They have an exact number of characters which are required for the the, 14, the compiled Fortran um, 
modules to to handle and deal with this data. And that's, that's one of the big problems with this system, a big challenge, let's say, to get through. But uh, if we access that soil profile by name, we can do a, just a single profile that we know. Now, it took me a couple of minutes. There were 121 profiles. Let's see how long it takes to read just a single profile. Three, two, one. Boom, and it's just very fast. <clears throat> so we can we can rename a profile. We've got our single profile, and uh, we want to make maybe we want to make a customize it in some way. Maybe we want to start with that as a baseline, but we've gone out and measured some stuff, and we have some be better measure and whatever the S sat um, profile parameter is that we measured, and we've and we. Um, have got better values. We can we can edit it directly, accessing the name of those parameters. So um, just to give you an example, it's very fast. Three, two, one, boom. So now we've got a new profile, which we've which we've um, edited from this profile, and uh, we can um, we we can also write it with our new values. I'm not going to uh, write that. I'm just going to append the um, the new file. And in fact, I think I will need to um, run this code. And I'm going to append that to the end of um, of our um, of our our soil dot sol file. So if I put a pen true, it won't overwrite it. It'll just add it to the end. Of course, you will probably want to make a new directory to do this kind of stuff. Let me just reopen this file. So it did say that I've just um, it's been edited at 453. So it did edit and append it. I'm just going to go to the bottom, and boom, we have a um, IB new 0001. And I had run this before, and it's actually appended my new. Uh, these should be the same numbers. It's appended it twice. So you have to be a little careful here. There's no, there is no safety net for overriding your primary data, but I don't think that's a bad thing because um, you have to, you have to take it responsibility for your own data um, file storage structures uh, anyway. So that I don't view that at, in particular as a limitation. And the thing I think is really neat about this is there's a capability for incorporating weather. So if you're making a simulation from a past experiment, we need to account for the weather. And if you want to simulate experiments into the future, you also have to um, predict the weather. And there is a full package that allows you to predict the future weather. They recommend using 30 years of historical weather. And to um, what it does is it takes the daily average and the variation, and it creates a stochastic prediction in a forward simulation of weather. And in a growing season, if you do this, one of the neat things, I can't show it to you today, but um, one of the things I'm most excited about about this system is we could start at the day of planting, we could predict what the weather will be like in the future, and therefore what, what the yield and what the optimal harvest date would be, for example. And uh, as the weather data rolls in, you could run your new model with the updated weather as you know it, maybe on the 10 day weather forecast, uh, and your model will update and you can you can have a live prediction of where your model is. And what happens is um, if you make you make a simulation, a stochastic simulation and the variation in the prediction measures are uh, wide, the expected error in that is wide. But as time goes on, the the error comes down until you actually know the weather and can make a solid prediction on the yield. So it's pretty neat, this weather package. I'm just going to read in the, um, if we go to the weather folder, you can just peek in it. And we have, all, again, weather files from all over the place. I just scroll down a little bit. Let's go up to the top. Now uh, we tend to have weather from again one point on the Earth, and if we look at points near our point on the Earth, they'll tend to have similar weather. 
how far apart in let's say kilometers how far apart in the uk do you think um there would be significant weather differences enough to have a unique weather profile well, what is what is your feeling let's take a quick quick survey i don't want to run out of time completely how many kilometers would you have to travel in the UK, do you think, before you'd have different enough weather that it starts in impacting crop, all other things being equal, including soil and everything? 50 kilometers, 10 kilometers, those are good guesses. I, I don't know how much. It, it does depend somewhat on the geography. If you, have, if you have mountains and valleys over within 10 or 50 kilometers, you know, it's going to be shorter. And if you have the Norfolk Broads, um, it, it might be, it might be uh, longer distances, but uh, that's in the scale, the same scale as I'm thinking. Um, the data set that, that we've been using for weather inputs is um, is uh, 50 kilometers. So we have been getting different points if they're more than 50 meters apart. Um, so you have one of these weather files. For different locations, and you have things like um, the the date, the um, solar radiation, the max temperature, the min temperature, uh, and the rainfall. Those are just measured every day on average. And if you have hourly weather, you average it for the day. And this format is the um, is the DSAT format for days. It's quite easy. So this was from the year 1956. And it was for the Julian date 001. So there should be 365 dates. Uh, and, and for this year, it must have been leap year because there are 366. Um, that's the format for the Julian date. Julian date is just a way to have the date starting at the at one equals January 1st for some year. All right, so uh, I'm just going to go quickly through some of this code and uh, get to the end, and I'm just going to talk you through it. I'm going to stop with the details so we can finish quick because we're out of time. So uh, what this is doing is it's just grabbing the names of all the weather uh, files. We can look at that file list, and it's just got the names of all the different weather files. You can see across this that there are different years. There are none. You, uh, in the base installation, there are not a lot of um, brand new weather files. You have to add that yourself. We're using a source from NASA to get for our project with this. And then I've just um, I've just uh, read all of the data um, files in. I've appended with paste the directory location with my list of file names. And um, I'm reading them all in. This will take a few minutes. Let's just let that run. It's quite inefficient doing this. Um, and it, I explained the inefficiency before is that <laughs> it has to parse um, every line and every column of the um, of the text files for these inputs. And there are quite a lot of them. I think it's interesting to see how long it, it takes. <clears throat> Still running. It's just going to take a minute or two. Eventually, um, I think I will stop that just because we're out of time, and I'm just going to read in one particular one. Okay, and it it just read in the uh, things. Now this particular one had some um, parameters for the dew point, wind, evaporation, and you, you can read in quite a lot of stuff, especially if it's relevant for your crop. But uh, the ones we're most interested in here are the solar radiation, Tmax and Tmin, and the rainfall. Those are the things that, well, rain, as you know, often limits um, plant growth, and that's built in the bi biological plant growth model, and also the temperature, the degree days that a plant experiences limits growth. And uh, and Paul will know this very well, especially for a root crop. It's the same with potatoes that built into the models for root crops. There is the soil temperature conversion from the air temperature T max and T min 
that uh, that builds into the model how the soil temperature affects development of the crop yield. OK, so uh, we can combine that and uh, we can we can perform descriptive statistics for simulations by averaging the temperature. I'm not going to run this because we're going to run out of time and we can um, we can um, calculate monthly averages um, for models if we wanted just a, a month by month snapshot of growth for long developing crops. Mostly almost every system you would want to do this would be day by day development. Runs very fast uh, when it does run. I won't demonstrate it uh, a real crop simulation running here. Um, and we can, you know, just manipulate R to uh, to summarize this stuff. Now the the system for designing a simulation, they call every simulation an experiment. And it took me a while. I was confused when I learned about this because a lot of the what, the things we have to know in a uh, to simulate crop yield have to do with how um, extrinsic factors impact growth and yield. And uh, the way that we learn about that stuff, as scientists, is with um, an experiment where we go out and manipulate those things we think affect plant growth and yield. <clears throat> so they use the term experiment like that in the DSAT system, but they also use the term experiment to mean one simulation. So it they don't even make a distinction. I had to work that out for myself, and I, I was confused for a while. But uh, we do this, we define the parameters of an experiment with the experiment file, the so-called file X. And uh, here I'm going to read one in. I'm going to read one in for uh, <clears throat> for wheat. This is a wheat X file, WHX. Notice that there's an 8.3 file naming convention um, that was also a uh, evolved and mutated from the Fortran days, uh, but it does still have some value. This is uh, the state of Kansas. Uh, this will be the name of probably a biological field station. This is from 1981, and it's, it's experiment 01. It's experiment one. So we can read in the file X. <clears throat> Take a second to read it in. We can just kind of have a look at what's in it. There's all sorts of stuff in it. Let's look at the structure up here in the global environment. <clears throat> so it reads in as a list, and there's some general information. Who did the experiment, where it was done, what the site name is. If we go down to um, what the treatments are, there were six treatments, and they were, um, it looks like they were um, codified, so we would have to look up what the what the code was. I don't know whether these are trade elements or what, but they they usually have a name in the treatments file. I'm going to spare you of looking in the um, experiment file, but it, it all the information's there. But probably we would have to go to the reference material to understand the codes of the numbers uh, if you wanted to use this in earnest. <clears throat> but what we can do is we can build experiments right at the command line here, or right in the script. With R, so we can put into our um, file X a new field called irrigation and management, and we can um, base it on something that exists and model it after an existing file. And further, we can set it for some date where we want to exploit existing conditions. Of course, for most of the stuff that I'm interested in, I want to do future predictions about a current field season, and so. This is a starting point to be able to do it with your own experiments. And then we would rewrite a new file. <clears throat> now, generating a batch file, I could not get this to work, um, even after a couple of hours of work. Uh, and it's mutated in the newest version of DSAT, and I don't have access to the older version of DSAT. I did try 4.7.5. Um, but I believe that this guy probably started programming this with an earlier version of 4.7 than the one that I have access to. What I was able to do um, was just to read a summary file. So this is the result of after you run a DSAT um, file, whoops, 
Let's just look in um, in a DSAT summary file. I'm trying to remember where I put it. This is worth worth looking at real quick. Um, so in Dropbox, in DSAT, let's just look at a at a summary out. Now this is a really big file, and it, you can see it stretches really long, and it's still wrapping around. So um, this is one that I ran that week that I was in um, in Georgia, and it was it was based on um, uh, the the summary of a of an experiment, <clears throat> and it has a huge number of fields. Um, but ultimately, what we want to do is to look at the plant grow um, output file that's got everything in it. At, uh, <clears throat> that we need. It's also a long file. Some of the things we want to look at in this are things like the, you know, some measure of yield, like leaf area index, that uh, being how fast uh, the green foliage covers an area, and the um, <clears throat> days after planting, the DAP. Um, but there are other measures of yield that are often um, interesting here. Here, I'm just going to read in that plant grow file to demonstrate what it looks like. And I'm just going to make a, uh, a XY plot of the leaf area index. <clears throat> and now this, this average is over the leaf area index for six treatments. Um, and I wasn't able to get the filter to work uh, in the, in, for this version of um, the output file to show the uh, the different, to automate the process of showing the different ex, um, experimental treatments for leaf area index. Now, why is there a step um, in this? Um, I'm not sure. <laughs> it's the simple answer, but I think it probably has something to do with the fact that this is a stepped average uh, uh, for these and something funny is going on that we would only be able to discern with it. Now uh, I've spent about I spent about three hours creating this modest text file, and I still wasn't able to get it to run from a script in R. And I'll just last before we uh, shut it down. I'll just show you um, the real interface for DSAT. Showed you a picture of it before. See if I can find it. I think I have it open. So this is the um, the real interface. <clears throat> and uh, the thing that I showed you was uh, the tool modules, some um, accessory modules. Um, they have a something called the sensitivity analysis module, which I didn't mean to. I'm just going to close that because I didn't mean to start it up. But uh, that one is very good, um, but it is just very difficult to use. Uh, I think the tools, the one I wanted to show was um, was weather data. It's got a very dis, uh, disarming uh, welcome voice that comes up. But uh, this allows you in an automated way through menus to simulate your own weather data for your own site. But a thing that I really like that it does is that it um, it does the sensitivity analysis through time and does that step updating the weather um, data um, automatically. And uh, it also allows you a, a user interface to um, to create your own station, you know, your own geocentric location for your own weather file um, through menus, if you like to do it that way. But I don't like to do it that way, so I'm going to persevere with R for now, and uh, we'll see if Philip Alderman responds to us um, about uh, updating his uh, his packages. And, and if he doesn't, um, we're considering, uh, I'm considering, making my own R interface, probably not with a tidyverse to start with, but uh, probably also not like Philip Alderman. I'll, I'll probably do it with Garrett Hugenboom 
who's the current um, the current uh, caretaker of DSAT, <clears throat> and I spoke with him about this at the at the workshop. So this is just a blast to introduce this to you. If you are interested in it, we're going to be doing some more work with this, and uh, up until um, after Christmas time. And uh, that's all I have to say for now. I hope the next time we talk, I have a, a an R interface to launch the uh, the program and push my own experiments to it from the command line to show you, or better yet, maybe George and Matt can show you theirs. That's all I've got. I've got to sign off, guys. Thanks for sticking around, and I'll see you in a couple of weeks. Good night. <laughs>